here with me, Amir Sarfati. I know if you don't know him, you're going to be thrilled to meet him today, to hear his story of God's goodness and grace in his life. So again, thanks for tuning in and let's get started. Amir Sarfati, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, you are somebody that Jay and I have watched regularly. Your updates on YouTube and Facebook. Uh, we've followed you, I think, since like 2018 or 2019. Um, I think partly because I, I grew up, my dad has led tours ever since I was a little girl. Grew up going to Israel. I have a love for Israel. And so when you would do just live updates, from Israel. I was always very interested to see what is going on in Israel, but I think you're also known for your biblical teaching on prophecy, your unique perspective as a Christian Israeli Jew, and and we love your Middle East update. So you can follow Amir on Telegram, which is where I mostly follow you. I got off social media for a little while, although I'm back on, but still I stick with Telegram because I think that is the safest place so far. So again, I just want to say thank you so much for being here, for being willing to share your story. I know there are a lot of people that know you, but there's also a lot of people that have never met you before. So for those who have never met you before and don't know much about you, would you mind just introducing yourself, telling us a little bit about who you are today? And then I'd also love to hear just about what brought you to where you are today, to the man that you are. Well, so I'm Israeli born, um, and right now I'm leading the Behold Israel ministry, which is a ministry that started as a, a way to give unfiltered news about Israel and the Middle East, uh, because, you know, we're very, very much uh, infected by fake news, mm -hmm. misinformation and disinformation. But uh, it also evolved into a ministry that is going beyond just giving news. It's also giving the good news, yeah. which is the news about uh, Yeshua, about Jesus. And um, my favorite subject uh, in the Bible is the Bible prophecy, not because, uh, you know, the other parts are not good. The other parts are great. It's yeah. just that I think that prophecy is the one thing that people stay away from because they don't understand it. Mm -hmm. And there's so much confusion evolved around this and so people decide to stay away. once you stay away from prophecy you stay away from the greatest blessings and promises of god and uh, coming from the nation that is all about the promises of god mm. and all about being the literal uh, fulfillment of of the blessing and the promises i think that the only way you can understand god mm -hmm. and his heart for his nation is if you are in the prophetic part of the scriptures, which is mm -hmm. almost 30% of it. Mm. Um, <clears throat> I, I was born to a Jewish family mm -hmm. um, in, in uh, the suburbs of Jerusalem. Um, the hospital was in Jerusalem, of course, but we lived uh, a little bit west of, of the city. Um, my parents divorced when I uh, was very, very young, mm -hmm. uh, t between two and three years old. Um, and uh, my father couldn't uh, raise me and my my uh, my siblings, so we were given to his sister okay. uh, for a few years. And uh, sh then she couldn't uh, do it all by herself because she had her own kids. Mm -hmm. And then she asked my dad to take us back, and he took us back, but he already remarried and had another woman with her own kids. So we ended up being sent to foster care. Wow. Uh, the age of uh, <clears throat> seven. So was it just you at that time? No, me and my brother. Me and your in brother. The beginning, okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so the age of uh, second grade, uh, okay. the age of seven, I wow. uh, was sent to. But again, up until then, I was not uh, living with you know with yeah. my two parents. Yeah. Um, you were kind of shuttled around. <clears throat> correct. From family member to family exactly. member. Exactly. And... Uh, and I was a little confused. Who's my parent? You know, right. who's my father and mother, and what's going on here? Yeah. So then, um, between the age of seven and eight, uh, second grade, it was the probably the worst year hmm. that left a lot of uh, marks, and and uh, <clears throat> um, um, I would say. Uh, um, up until today, I have to deal with a lot of stuff that, uh, well, you know, happened to me there. It was, mm. you know, a real a criminal abuse. Mm. Um, and 
because it was so bad, uh, the authorities, the social worker that dealt with our case saw that there is a deterioration yeah. in me and my, uh, my brother, and they mm -hmm. uh, rescued us from that place and moved us to another uh, uh, foster care. Mm -hmm. And this is where I, uh, I spent about 10 years. Okay. So it was uh, two years with my parents, which I don't remember anything from yeah. that, apart from a maybe a little glimpse of fights between the two of them. Mm -hmm. And then we moved to my aunt, and then one year with uh, my dad with a wife that didn't like us, mm -hmm. and then we were taken to that terrible place, and then we were moved to another place. So, okay. and uh, so you can see the pattern is, it's no neglect, hope. rejection. Exactly. There's no hope. No identity. Nothing. Yeah. Um, no foundation. No. And there's you know. Uh, you know, I, um, the abuse, uh, I mean, there's a lot of abuse, but the abuse in, during that year, which was really criminal, um, left its marks for, for, for a very long time. So, I mean, by the age of 17, I find myself, here it is, it's almost uh, um, 10 years later, and I look back and I see no hope. I see yeah. that uh, things are not good. They were not good then, they're yeah. not good now. And I concluded, mm -hmm. which I believe a lot of kids at the age of 17 come to that conclusion, unfortunately, is that if it wasn't good then and if it isn't good now, it certainly will not be good yeah. in the future. Yeah. And I, I'm not a person that <clears throat> wants to do things just because you do things. I need to either understand why mm -hmm. I do it or I don't do it. Okay. So I needed to understand why I'm, why am I here? Right. And if I, if there is no point of being here, mm -hmm. I don't want to be here. So in this season of, you know, you're 17, yeah. what's your relationship like with your brother? Like, well, you my brother with was him? with me for a few years and okay. then he had to be taken out of the foster family and he was in some uh, other, uh, you know, another family, another, home. it wasn't a family, more like a um, home. Um, a place uh, like, you know, when I say boards, yeah. bo boarding, so it's, boarding school, yeah, boarding school here is for the rich people, mm. but, uh, but in like Israel, that. it's exactly the opposite. Okay. So kind of like an orphanage in a way, but with lots of kids, like yeah. you're about, uh, probably 200. Mm -hmm. That's, that's a big, big uh, okay. place. Wow. Whereas my foster care, that family, we were about 12. Okay. So again, we're not talking about. Like the foster uh, system that American right. people know where it's two people, two kids or one kid mm -hmm. or four kids. We're talking about like a business. Yeah. OK, so wow. we we were four in one okay. room and wow. um, mm. but that was better than that terrible year when we were 12 in one room. So in that year, um, that terrible year where there was abuse. So there were other kids there as well. Yes. OK, so it was one of those it establishments. Was, it was, yeah. It was, where they were uh, supposed to be caring for kids. And does the state give money to those places? Yes, okay. of course. So like it is here. Yeah, but they, okay. we're talking about, in both cases, it would business. Right. When, when you have 12 kids, it's not anything but You know what's business. coming to my mind is Orphan or the Annie, Annie movie and Mrs. Hannigan. Yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Something like that. Only, <laughs> only uh, in both cases, uh, you know, when you think about foster care in America, mm -hmm let's say you're a foster parent, mm -hmm. you don't have your foster kid eating different food no, in a different place. Absolutely well, not. We, they become a part of your did. family. Okay. We were not part of any family. Really? We were the foster kids. Wow. So the foster kids had their own food and they ate in their own place. Um, huh. and Interesting. That's it. It's different. So okay. and again, so, so when you say foster care, yeah. uh, when you tell that to American people, I think they get the wrong is it still idea. that way in Israel? Yeah, I believe I believe in some places, I, 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 you know, uh, I guess, but uh, I, I don't know. Hmm. <laughs> I don't know. I am not. So you don't have friends in no. Israel that are foster parents? I know parents. that my 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 or... uh, my wife's family, um, when my father was still alive, they were foster family for two kids uh, for a couple okay. years. Okay. okay. But <laughs> it's night and day from what I had. Of right. Course. Um, and a testimony to that is wow. that both of them are now married and they invited 
my in-laws yeah. to the marriage, you know, the wedding That's and cool. all of that. So it was just very good. Anyway, yeah. in my case, I, I, I got to the age of 17. I was in love with a girl. I don't even think she knew, knew my, about my existence. <laughs> Look, the funny thing is this. I never let anyone know that I'm in a foster kid. In other words, oh. the teachers would know. In some cases, they knew. None of my classmates knew. Really? I had to work so hard mm. to cover up. Yeah. So hard to be normal, to look mm. normal, to be normal. Um, so, for example, you know, parents would, you know, would prepare sandwiches for right. their kids. Well, we had to prepare our own sandwiches. And when we prepare our own sandwiches, when you're eight, how do you prepare a sandwich? Okay. You and put candy in there? Or? No. <laughs> but another thing, I was never, we were never allowed to open the fridge and take whatever we want whenever we want. So, wow. so for, uh, for me, the first time I ever opened a fridge without asking somebody's permission was when I got married. Oh my goodness. Yeah. I, my mom bought for us uh, a fridge. And I, th I, I stood mm. right in front of it and I opened it like 50,000 times mm. just to have the feel of, of you know, little yeah. things that are so obvious to yeah. other people were not obvious to me. So is your relationship with your mom and dad? Yeah. Well, Has my dad passed away. That's right. That's my right. dad passed away uh, in December of 2021. Okay. So had um, it been restored to a degree at all? Or? No. I never, honestly... Um, I cannot say that this is a, a relationship of a son and a father. Yeah. He, he never raised me. Right. And he was very selfish, very much into himself. And and um, I tried. Honestly, when I got saved at the age, later on we'll talk about yeah, it. Yeah. Um, I actually wrote letters to my parents and where mm. I just tell them how much I didn't love them and how much now I forgive them. Okay. And now I actually, you know, it's all behind me. Well, <laughs> did they respond to that? It's funny because when I wrote the letter, I was already in military service and they sent the shrink to my unit. They thought it's a suicide letter. They thought they thought I said oh. goodbye to they, they actually because you thought, were forgiving uh, them. Exactly. <laughs> you're closing. You Nobody know, the does circle. that except a crazy yeah, person. Exactly. <laughs> What's going on here? Is he saying goodbye? Yeah. Is that a, anyway, oh. it's funny. I mean, the good is bad and the bad is good. Well, anyway, yeah, with my dad, I have a lot of regrets, honestly, yeah. a lot of regrets because um, I, I did not love him. Mm. I, I did not love him. I did not. I did not seek any relationship with him because there was no relationship to begin with. And besides yeah. the title, f my father, there was nothing there. Yeah. And uh, I, I was very mad, very angry. Mm -hmm. I mean, even years after I got saved. I was not angry with with his choices. I was angry with when he would pretend to be like uh, everything is okay now, and because yeah. you know, I, I remember my son had a bar mitzvah, mm. and my dad was offended that I did not invite several of his of his relatives, mm. and I was so angry that yeah. he even think he has a say here. Right. I never grew up, none of them even know me or yeah. are interested in me. Why would I invite them? Just, I would invite my neighbor over Before my that, yeah. uncle or, you know, so. <laughs> Which I uh, think a lot of people can relate to that, you know, whether yeah. it's through di divorce or. Correct. You yeah. Know. So, uh, yeah, okay, my so dad. So you're 17. So correct. I know I keep interrupting your story because I'm just curious about all the mm -hmm. things, but so you're 17 and you like a girl. She doesn't know your yes. name. Actually, she knew me, but not not in a way of someone that she would ever even think of okay. as, as a date. She was way out of your league. She or... was way out of my <laughs> league. And she actually she thought I I should introduce her to my friend. <laughs> I was like, the look, um, I was. <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> yeah, I was not an option for anyone. Yeah, yeah. I, I mm. and not because anyone knew about my situation. It's because mm. I was just a, you know, the good student that you can take his notes and use and you can count on him to mm. do this and to do that. Mm -hmm. And, but I was, cause listen, part of it is, I think I was afraid also because there was, where mm -hmm. will I bring anyone? Yeah. I have no house. I yeah. have, no, how can I bring them to a house where I, I don't even have the right to open mm -hmm. the fridge? Mm -hmm. I don't even look, 
I didn't even sit on the sofa. We sat on the floor on mm. on carpets. Um, uh, that's, that's crazy. That's where we are. Yeah. That's crazy. And um, so mm. for for me, I don't take anything for granted today. And I I think that throughout my adult life, I realized that. Uh, I do not want my kids to go through what I did. Right. And, um, you know, and any hardship you have in your marriage can, mm -hmm. should not end up where my parents ended up. Right. Okay. Because yeah. eventually your children will pay the price for it. Yeah. And uh, anyway, so, yeah. um, so I got to the point at the age of 17 with that, you know, I, I, I listen to Barbara Streisand's <laughs> very sad songs all day long oh, no. thinking you know it's uh that's it and i i just wanted to kill myself mm -hmm. because i didn't think anything will ever get better yeah i saw no hope in my past i saw no hope in my present so i concluded there's definitely no hope in the future and i didn't want to stay here uh, honestly i'll yeah. be very very honest with you there yeah. there was no hope nothing to live for Everything around me was phony, was bad, was terrible. I I thought about I don't pre, I don't play this game. If this is what life is, yeah. I am checking out. Mm. So, so what changed? Well, um, so I already had enough pills ready to take and say goodbye. Like wow. I prepared it, everything. Mm. <laughs> and uh, what changed is that um, the night I wanted to do it. Um, something, I know today what that something is, but mm -hmm. then I thought so, something was telling me, give this world one last chance. Hmm. I, I was covered with cold sweat. Yeah. I was crying. I thought to myself, because it's irreversible, you know, that's right. it. No, yeah. nobody would go and check on me. I mean, it's, it's not gonna mm. end up well. So I thought to myself, you know what? Okay. One last chance. That was the week that I learned that my best friends in school uh, are actually Messianic uh, believers. I, I had no clue. Look, I, really? knew they're, I knew they're great friends okay. and they have different sets of values yeah. and they're very different. This mm -hmm. is what I prefer to be friends with. Mm -hmm. But um, the reason why I got to know their faith is because I decided to give the world one last chance mm -hmm. and that was just the, the, the high school diploma uh, exams season so okay. i thought i'm gonna study at my friends for one exam and he's gonna come over and study uh with me for one exam so when i came to his place so you know we're sitting all around the table and um all the kids are holding hands and uh mm. close their eyes and the father is praying wow. for the food you know it's a normal meal you, you pray before them you know you know Christians, we don't have prayer book. We don't have to open right. a certain page and read the blessing of the food or whatever. We just pray. Mm. So I'm like, what's going on here? Mm. Everybody close their eyes and the father is just talking to God mm -hmm. and even thanking him for me being there, mm. which was like, whoa. And he finished the prayer in, in Hebrew with Veshem Yeshua, mm. which means in the name mm. of Jesus. I was like, what's, what's that? I mean, for us, the Jewish people, it's not, I always tell people, they don't hate Jesus. They don't know him. They don't mm -hmm. have a clue. Wow. It's just really, uh, no one ever told me about Isaiah 53. No one ever told me about Isaiah, uh, you know, 7 and Isaiah 9, Isaiah 11. No one ever told me about you know, the New Testament being something that the Old Testament already prophesied about. No one ever told me that there's prophecies about him being born in Bethlehem. I was just like, I mean, they started showing me stuff because I asked. And then I honestly, okay, I, I love the prophets. I love mm. the Old Testament, which to me, the, that's the Bible. Yeah. yeah. By then. Mm-hmm. But I couldn't understand this whole B'Shem Yeshua thing. Why every mm. prayer has to end up in this thing. I mean, think about it. So many Christians are on automatic all the time. They say, name of Jesus, amen. Name of Jesus, amen. Name mm -hmm. of Jesus, amen. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they don't even mean it. <laughs> Sometimes mm -hmm. they just say it because you say it. Yeah. And remember, I'm not like that. I, I, I cannot say it. I cannot 
under, if I don't understand why, I will not be part of it. So, um, so I, it bothered me. Mm-hmm. It bo- I mean, I love everything. I, lo- I see genuine relationship yeah. with, with a living God, happy, wonderful people. It's funny, but 20 years later, I can see all the flaws. But then I saw nothing but unbelievable perfect perfect yeah. you know mm-hmm. perfe- uh, perfection so so here i am asking the million dollar question mm-hmm. okay so who is jesus why do you have to pray in this guy's name yeah. all the time and although they you know showed me the the prophet i couldn't really understand it, it had to be so was this a conversation you had with your friend? Yes, or with his I, I family? asked. I asked the family yeah. exactly, because look, I I felt so comfortable with mm-hmm. them that I would go from school directly to their house. Okay, and I would stay there for hours. We mm. we would uh, sing together, wow. and I. By the way, I love singing. I don't know if you know, but I recorded a few CDs. You did? Yes, I was. Uh, I I'm was have to tell uh, no, Marlene but that. you will <laughs> not. That's that's. This is. I think that's the first time I even uh, say that on any podcast. But mm. I was on um, friends of mine who recorded the CD. Uh, you know, uh, their own album. I was the back vocals of for that. I was also. I don't know if you know Paul Wilbur. Have you heard of yes, him? Yes, I love. Well, Paul, Paul Wilbur. came to Jerusalem to record a an album called Shalom Jerusalem. Okay. Very famous one from yes. the nineteen nineties, and I'm. There, I'm, Paul I'm, Wilbur has come to Cedar Park Church a go. number of times over the years, so, so we love him. So if you ever go online to, to look at Shalom Jerusalem that was, was recorded in May of 1995, mm-hmm. you'll see me in the back <laughs> singing. <That's laughs> anyway, so, cool. so singing was uh, something I always liked. <laughs> Acting is something, okay. even in high, in high school, the, the, the very, very end, when we graduated, there was um, sort of a, uh, some sort of a play. And I was one of the main characters. Yeah. All right. So is that anywhere on singing, YouTube? Look. <laughs> we no, that, that, one, video. that one, I'm not sure. <laughs> oh, man. I hope it's not going to surface. Anyway, the thing is, though, that um, so I would be with them. I would hold hands as they pray mm-hmm. and they will always pray and say, Bishemish. But I couldn't yeah. figure this thing couldn't out. Couldn't get the leap no. to Jesus. No. Yeah. So one, one of the... Le- women there she said why don't you just go to god and ask god hmm. who jesus is like me Good like idea. talking to him yeah. like that directly she said yes i was very nervous hmm. you know i don't mind people pray next to me but i never prayed wow. like that like just talk to god hmm. and i've been to synagogues hundreds of times before during holidays and it wasn't really an intimate it was more watching somebody else. Yeah, I never or... conversed with God. I was reading prayers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I remember I was so nervous. So I, I put on a, on a piece of paper, God, please show me who Jesus is. I put it on a wall. I knelt down and I read for it. I was afraid to say the wrong thing. Yeah. So the <laughs> next morning I woke up and, and I forgot to tell you that uh, I've learned in young age that if you want to, to get along in this world, you have to play by the rules. And this foster family owned a uh, grocery store, and they expected me to work there. Okay. Or so else. you didn't get paid? No. It was <laughs> to get paid. I mean, wow. I knew that the, uh, if I want some privileges, re, you know, in life, not not payment, I'm talking about, you know, obvious things like yeah. staying, wa- uh, staying up a bit later or... Okay. I have to work. And by the way, I don't have a problem with that. I mean, I think they taught me a good lesson of hard work. Everybody in the family needs to contribute something. So, um, yeah, but, you know, for me, I had to go to work before school. I have to go to school. Then I have to come back, go to work again, and then come back to do my homework and everything. So I remember that morning. And again, if I ever saw it in negative way, look at how God used it. Mm -hmm. So... That morning, I wake up early. I don't know why, but I'm super happy. I go to work. I put together. So going to work early in the morning in a grocery store in Israel, you obviously open the doors, the, all the gates, all the locks and everything. You un- unlock the, the alarm. And then you bring the fresh bread inside and you put it in the shelves. Then you bring all the dairy products inside. You put them in the fridge. And the last thing you do 
you bring the different parts of the morning newspaper mm -hmm. and you put them together. Okay. And while I did that, that was my favorite part because I'm a news junkie. Yeah. And I love to read. I was already at the age of 17. I was a walking newspaper. And, <laughs> um, and so I would put, while I was putting together the morning newspaper parts, I would read the whole thing. Mm. So here I am opening the, the main front page of the number one morning newspaper in Israel. And I see inside it says Yeshua. What? And that was the morning after I prayed. Wow. Yeshua, big, bold, capital Hebrew letter, Yeshua. Now, Whoa. bear in mind, Jews don't call him Yeshua. Wow. They don't. Uh, they call him Yeshu. It's a, mm. an acronym of a curse. They don't even know that. Oh, Most wow. of them don't have a clue, but it's an acronym of a curse. May his name and memory be erased forever. That's the hope of Israel. He's the yeah. hope of Israel. So here I am, um, you know, going back home. And for the first time. I was thankful that we as foster kids mm. don't sit with the adults. Mm. We don't have a shared table with the authorities. Wow. I could actually speak to all the kids around the table. No one could tell you know, what I tell them because that's it. Wow. It's, we were sitting elsewhere. And I told everyone, you're all sinners. <laughs> Here I am. You know? And I told them, and, and what really yeah. became my my number one go-to uh, scripture was mm -hmm. Isaiah chapter 53. Look, I will be very honest with you. To come to an Israeli and to pull John 3.16, it won't work. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it won't work because they don't accept the New Testament to begin with as the Word of God. And uh, even Jesus never mm -hmm. used John 3.16 to lead anyone to him. In fact, Jesus never used any New Testament mm. portion. When Jesus talked to the Jewish people and quoted scriptures, it was always Old Testament. And I thought to myself, if I want to talk to my own people, I need to know my Old Testament very well. Yeah. And so Isaiah 53 for me was the top, number one. You know, If you can explain to me What, what, what it is and, and prove that it's not Jesus, you know, then I might bite, but you can't. Yeah. Is There's there a portion no of Isaiah 53 that you want to read? Well, I yeah, you have I, your Bible yes, with you. And I have my, that... my Hebrew English Bible. And, and of course, uh, this is something that, uh, uh, I mean, we're I here to preach to Jesus. So there you go. So Isaiah 53, here it is, uh, with all of my, the most yeah. highlighted part of your yes, Bible. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So, um, you know, who has believed our report and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. It's interesting, mm -hmm. contrary to whatever people try to teach you, that Jesus was so beautiful, long mm -hmm. hair, blonde, yeah. his Swedish type hippie. Um, you know, this, you yes. can tell that it wasn't the looks of Jesus that draw people to him. Yeah. And, and, and it says there was no beauty that we should desire him. There's, there's no desire in the flesh here. Yeah. It was something else. And he's despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Mm -hmm. And we hid, as it were, our face from, uh, faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne borne our griefs and carried our sorrows yet we esteemed him stricken smitten by god and afflicted but he was wounded for our transgressions he was bruised for our iniquities the chastisement for our peace was upon him yeah. and by his stripes we are healed and we like sheep have gone astray we have turned everyone to his own way and the lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And then mm -hmm. he was oppressed and yeah. he was afflicted and he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shears it is silent. So he opened not his mm -hmm. mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the lying, of the living. And for the transgressions of my people, He was 
stricken. You know, if you mm-hmm. can, and then think think about it. Daniel later on in chapter nine talked about how Messiah was cut off. I mean, he was here. It says that he was he was killed, and not for anything that he did. Mm. Not about something that it was his fault. Yeah. It was all about us for us. And so this 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 whole thing it it, it goes on and on. But it, it's yeah. amazing because I am reading this, and I okay. There's no other explanation. Yeah, this is it. If Isaiah could see it hundreds yeah. of years earlier, and he could prophesy from chapter seven and on, on so many places, you could see Christ throughout this uh, prophet. I said, okay, this is it. Yeah. So that's it. Uh, uh, it's funny because um, you know, around the table, uh, we're about I think ten or twelve kids, mm-hmm. and there's one one guy my age. I don't like. Okay. <laughs> I fa- we always fought. We were the same age group. Uh, yeah. He was. Uh, he, he, he was competitive, me- maybe. Com- yes, yeah. he was a few months older than me. Mm-hmm. He was born in February. I was born in October of the same year, mm-hmm. and uh, I just couldn't stand him. And uh, we didn't even talk. We worked together in the same place. We studied in the same school, but we we didn't talk. And so when I shared, uh, I kind of ignored him yeah <laughs> and i think god has a sense of humor because he's the only one who got saved and i'm That's stuck with amazing. him for eternity now <laughs> in a way but it's interesting wow. because uh, so now cool. both of us are now brothers in the lord and really? both of us a few weeks later mm-hmm. when the family found out that this is more serious than they thought because they thought it's some teenage craziness yeah and within a few days it'll pass but then they saw that more and more we, we go from school directly to our friends. We go to worship uh, services. We go to prayer meetings, just Bible studies. There's, they kind of lost control. Mm-hmm. And so one day we return and they waited outside of the house and they said, pack your things and get out of here. So, okay. So, so think you're about like 18 at that point. Almost. Almost. That's June of, of 2000, so you a few more of the, the year 1990. Uh, I'm a few days old in the Lord because yeah. I used to go to my friends before I got saved, mm-hmm. but now right after that's when that's it. You can't take it anymore. Mm-hmm. And, um, so I remember I, I, I had to pack, I'm 17 and a half. Well, what am I going to do? I'm yeah. packing my things. I don't have much, mm-hmm. but I know one thing now I can get rid of all the junk of a 17 year old. <laughs> And I can also take with me the things that I know I can, you know, take for life. And I was crying and laughing at the same time. Crying because I don't like this in the middle of, I mean, the last year of high school, in the middle of the exams Mm. of high school. I studied so hard and not to be kicked out of the house now. Yeah. But I, I, so I was very sad, you know, rejection mm-hmm. again, they mm-hmm. kick you out. Uh, finally, I found a place yeah. and now I'm relocating mm-hmm. again. But at the same time, I was also happy because I knew I start fresh. Mm-hmm. It's no longer bad light that leads to death. It's now I had to die to start. Now the you new have life. hope. Exactly. And so now I have hope and uh that's it i i i I moved to my aunt for a few months then i moved all the way to my friends uh you know my friends who who shared with me Mm -hmm. and i worked in a carpentry here i am a jew working as a carpenter (laughs) and uh i got uh baptized i was baptized in a swimming pool you think you would think that i would go to the (laughs) jordan river yeah that that is actually very ironic baptized in a swimming pool God and does have a sense yes, of humor. Yes, I was baptized in a swimming pool, and the <laughs> next day I joined the Israeli army. Who baptized you? Uh, that family. Okay. Yeah, that family. That's special. And mm-hmm. uh, we were three, four who got baptized. Wow. So here I am. I shared my faith with that, you know, that uh, foster kid mm-hmm. and another friend mm-hmm. who got saved also. So wow. the three of us... Um, got baptized it was a talk of the day the body of christ then was only two thousand people wow. in his jewish believers wow. everyone heard it's a big deal everyone heard that two wow. israeli born teenagers were saved hallelujah um, yes yes it and was look at you now yes 
Yeah. That's amazing. I love that portion of scripture. And I think one of the things that comes, you know, sticks out to me as someone, as you reading it, mm-hmm. that Jesus understands our afflictions, yeah. right? Cause he suffered so much more. And then as a young boy, you know, reading that you have a savior who suffered yeah. for you and understands your suffering like that, just that relatability yeah. of Jesus, that there's nothing that we're ever going to go through in life that Jesus yeah can't relate to you know and, and what comes to my mind is that um it, people that don't know christ and they're in the darkness there's mm-hmm. you know people walk in the darkness yeah you know the bible talks about how he came uh you know uh to the place uh, that was dark yeah and uh and, and upon that place light has dawned mm-hmm. and people are in the darkness the, what do they do they do the deeds of yeah, the darkness, yeah. and, uh, and and unfortunately, uh, you know, children are our target yep. in this whole thing. Yep. And I have a I have a very soft heart for, um, you know, both the unborn and children that are going through a lot of abuse. Well, you're like your heavenly father in that. <clears throat> yes. Because he has exactly. a very soft heart. For you know, it. these are the two things that I mean I can. I can lose it when I hear about yeah. this. This is too much for me. It's a lot. I cannot imagine how how people in good conscience can actually take the life. Sometimes you can take life of someone without killing him. Yeah. By just by taking his innocence, yeah. taking his future, yep. destroying him. And but but uh, even now, you know, there's a there's a new movie called Sound of Freedom, mm-hmm. which is about you know child trafficking, mm-hmm. and I'm about to go and watch it, but I'm I know it's going to be yeah, hard for me. Yeah, it's not a fun movie to watch. No. But I but we need to bring to awareness this yeah. thing. Yep. I mean, there's so much evil that is done in this world to children. Yep. And and those children, you know, hurt people, hurt people. Remember yeah, that. I mean, right. Unless you're saved, the 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 cycle is a vicious cycle. Mm-hmm. I mean, they will eventually grow up and do the same to yeah. others. Yeah. And so, you know, I see where God brought me yeah. out of darkness yes. into his marvelous yes. light. And so now I can tell the praises yeah. of that one yeah. and to everyone. And, uh, and you didn't just keep it to yourself. No. But I loved that you just went straight home and yeah. shared it with those people that... I you lived it. with, and you say, "Oh, only those two boys," you know, but you don't know. I don't know, right? No, the seeds I don't know. that are planted. I don't know. I we don't, don't know. know the time that the Lord brings yeah. about the harvest. Exactly. And maybe it's the la- their last breath that they'll remember those words yeah. and remember even your face, Correct. hearing those stories, because yeah. God loves you so much that mm-hmm. He sent His only Son, but He also loves the whole world, yeah. and so He's pursuing us, even in orphanages, even on the streets in the slums. You know, when we're even in our mother's womb, I was just talking to a friend today, like, you know, she was saying how children understand the concept of heaven so much better than adults. And we were talking about how it's because they were just so, so recently with God. Yes. It says that God formed us in the mm-hmm. womb. So we knew our heavenly father as we were being formed. And yep. so, you know, when, when we're born, like that closeness that we have with God. And I think the longer we live in this, on this earth, the longer we have the effects of this earth, we kind of forget and we get caught up in the distractions of this life. But God is always calling us back to himself. Yeah. And as a child, you're in your purest form. Yeah. And then it's just going south from there. I mean, unless, unless, unless you grab them young uh, to understand the way to truth in life, it's going to be harder. Anyway. So that's, that's basically, I joined the Israeli military, um, it's funny because I, I never saw myself as a military person. Mm-hmm. Never saw myself as, you know, someone with a knife right there uh, uh, in his teeth. And, you know, let's go and kill someone. But so you don't get a choice in Israel. Right? You don't get a choice. And, and it's interesting because, um, you know, if it was up to me, uh, if life didn't, uh, you know, give me enough crises, enough problems, until then, now I have the biggest one. I mean, military is very traumatic for mm-hmm. someone who's not into it. Yeah. And so here I am in the military, in the basic training of the Armored Corps, and it's hell on earth for me. And I'm thinking to myself, I don't want to do this. Mm-hmm. I'm not, this is not for me. Mm-hmm. So every night, because the option of me 
doing something to myself or the option to of me of 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 giving up even just giving up on this or on that there's no option anymore right now i have someone else yeah that is giving me the strength so every night i prayed mm. uh i used to sing a, there's a, a there's a, a hymn Anna Chazor na Yeshua, please come back, Jesus. <laughs> please <laughs> come back. Too. Please come back. Please come back. Every yes, night Jesus. I would sing that hymn. Please mm. come back. I need you to come back. Please put an end to all of this. I please come back. And every night mm. I would sing that song. Um, and mm. uh, he kept me through. And the funny thing is. Did others uh, hear you singing that song? Yeah, I, I didn't care. I mean, yeah. I was singing. Everyone they knew. Were like, Amen. <laughs> everyone knew what I believed yes, in. Yes, Jesus. <laughs> so then, what happened is, mm. um, they found something in my hand. My hand became weaker. My my hmm. my the palm of my hand became weaker and weaker and weaker, and it was paralyzed eventually. Wow. And uh, this one actually, it's uh, you can see the mark of the surgery. They had to mm -hmm. cut it and yeah. remove remove a, a growth that was sitting here mm. and that paralyzed it so um so here i am uh you know i i go through an operation uh, i recover and while i was home recovering as a soldier i received a letter from the military is that your ticket out i wanted to think that way okay <laughs> it was my ticket to actually serve longer it was the ticket to we think that you are uh, you are fit to become an officer, oh, no. which means you'll serve longer. Oh no! I'm th now, thankfully, to be an <laughs> officer, you have to volunteer. Okay. They cannot take you. Okay. Uh, I mean, so you, it was you, a request. Yes, they basically said, "Look, we think you can fit to be an officer. We want you to go and do some tests, mm -hmm. both physical tests and also psychological ones. And if you pass it, we are inviting you." to the officers academy which is hmm. something that i guess 10 percent gets okay. and so only 10 percent of those who get there will finish oh wow so here here i am i'm thinking this is a joke i, I was laughing so hard i said i don't want even do, i don't want to be there yeah what make you think that i want to serve a day longer and i my my whole hand is banded you know with yeah. band you say Bandaged. bandage and yeah. um i went to do the physicals and i don't know i thought it's going to hurt me and i did everything oh, no. i was in good shape <laughs> and then i thought okay i'm going to tell the guy the psychologist i'm going to tell him i'm a believer yeah instantly. scare him away yeah and he started asking questions and he evaluated me and I, when i left i i knew that's it if the physical was good. This one for sure will yeah. disqualify me. Yeah. Well, he said, you're good to go. I was like, what? <laughs> so then I thought, you know what? I, I'm still under the sovereignty of God. Yeah. You know, if God says you yeah. need to go, I need to go. Right. So I went there and every single day in my military service as a, in the officer's academy, which is in the middle of the desert, every day I knew it's my last day. Mm. So wow. every day I would share with people jesus and i wow. would because i knew that's the best way to get out you know they'll kick you out <laughs> you wanted to get i wanted out. to give them jesus but i also wanted them to kick me out so <laughs> here i am i was sure it's going to happen oh, sure no. enough the commander of the base uh, summoned me to his office and uh I, I i i thought this is it and then he said um i hear that you're talking to people about your thing and i said yes he said well <laughs> shut up until the end of the course he, he didn't kick me out he actually wanted me to continue well of course i didn't shut up right and the funny thing is that every weekend when they read the names of those who can who, who are not to continue and they read the names of the stay i was always ready to leave yeah and every time i was disappointed that i wow. have to stay and um wow make the long story short i i graduated you know i don't know even how but miracles after miracles yeah. literally it was the the coldest winter in history of israel mm -hmm. at that time it was 1991 92 it snowed in the desert in the southern part of israel it snowed i mean meets ramon the ramon crater the negev was covered with snow who would believe 
And I needed to navigate, military navigation. Mm -hmm. I mean, how can you navigate when you see nothing besides snow? Um, it was the, the toughest conditions. It was, everything was mm. crazy and I did it. I, I, it was, I don't know how. I, God gave me yeah. uh, supernatural yeah. strength to go through all of that. Mm -hmm. And then I did it. And then I graduated. I asked them, you know, they said, okay, we want you to be part of the Ministry of Defense, the Israeli government in, in the Palestinian territories, whether Gaza, or West Bank. I said, look, I don't, whatever you want, but mm -hmm. I just don't think I need action in my life. So give me the most, <laughs> give me the most boring place nobody wants to go to. I'll be the one. I said, what's the most boring city? And I said, Jericho, nobody wants to go there. I said, I'll go. They said, I'm the first ever person that to chose to go. Yeah. yeah. And a few months later, the Jericho and Gaza agreement, Jericho from a city that nobody cared about becomes the yes. center of world Ugh. attention. Yeah. <laughs> and I find myself with international media from all over. I mean, literally, wow. I was on the front page of even the newspapers in America. Wow. And uh, from, again, someone who wanted to run away, I became the deputy governor of Jericho, later to be the one in charge of pulling out of Jericho, starting the new military unit mm. between Israel and Palestinians. And it was working with the Secret Service, working with Israeli military intelligence, working with the Palestinians themselves, learning to speak Arabic, mm. all of that. And that yeah. prepared me, I think, that really built my character and prepared me for my future. Yeah, and all the while, you know, spreading the gospel yes. of Jesus. My so you know I, why God brought absolutely. you to all those places. You see, when the new governor arrived, uh, a few months after I joined the military, the unit in Jericho, he was an ex-spy. Mm. Ex-spy means he trusts no one. He knows Syria very mm -hmm. well, Jordan very well. Wow. But so apparently a few months later, he called me into his office and he said, look, I've been watching you for a few months and uh, you're the only person in this unit. We're talking about hundreds of soldiers and officers. Only soldier, only officer I would take with me to a war. Wow. And then he, he said, this is a folder on the, on, this, on the table, top secret. If you say a word about it, you'll be in jail. In jail. Okay. And then he said, this is something that you can finally do something. I know you don't want to do anything, he mm -hmm. said to me. <laughs> he said, I already know that. That's why I trust you. Yeah, but he said, I did a lot of, I mean, he put so many tests along the way. Mm. And he said, I trust you, but uh, it's your decision now you want to be part of this new thing or you want to do continue to do nothing yeah. and be nothing he said to me i don't like that <laughs> so i said no i want to be something so anyway that, that's god was yeah look you have an amazing story and i feel like it yeah. just it's continuing yes, to this but, day but the bottom line is it was not me yeah it, exactly it has to be clearly communicated exactly here. it was not me i mm. it's not my strength it's not mm -hmm. my wisdom it's not anything god in yeah. his sovereign way yeah. and plan did that yep. to someone who wanted to kill himself a few That's years amazing. ago. amazing. Yeah. So how does, and I know you're a dad, um, <clears throat> and just maybe I know we don't have a ton of time left, but would love to just hear, how do your kids receive your story when they when you told them your story? You well, know, and I, how has that changed your parenting? Uh, look, I, I will be very honest with you. I, I'm not sure I'm the best parent in the world what yeah. <laughs> you're not perfect <laughs> no i'm not and, and you yeah. know honestly i was afraid of having children yeah and i remember when we first uh when I, we have our first you know boy and then when the girl came i thought that's it i don't want more mm. and my wife had to work hard on convincing me that you know two is just two we want yeah. more yes and I, I i was scared yeah to be a because I never had a father. I was I knew I will do all the possible mistakes in the world. Mm. I didn't even know what it means to be a father, and I knew that I will make all the mistakes uh, in the world. And you know, I was a tour guide. I worked as a tour guide, full time tour guide in Israel, which mm -hmm. means you're away from home mm -hmm. a lot, even mm -hmm. though you're in Israel. Yeah. But you know, group after group. Yeah. And, it's a you, big job yes. and it's not doesn't from not nine to five it's yeah. all day <laughs> correct so i was gone a lot and uh you know I, I i prayed god you know what i know i'm the worst dad but i know that you're the best dad mm. and i know 
that you know you can fill in for me yeah because you know I, I don't even know how to yeah. do those things yeah and he, he he blessed me with a great family of my father-in-law became <laughs> like my father mm. and he was like my pastor my best friend my look when we lost him uh, last yeah. year in accident you know in an unexpected yeah. way it crushed us because mm. for me that was my dad mm. for me and I brought him with me. Yeah. Me and Mike were in Italy. We we thought to do ministry. Um, and you know, he, he went through a tough time and I thought, you know, I'll bring him over. And we started in Sicily and we were planning on going to Rome and to Venice and to, you know, Milan and I planned on showing him everything and and mm. A day and a half after he showed up in Sicily, I found him dead in the, in his bed in the hotel room. Sorry. But but you know, um, I'm I'm thankful that I had him, yeah. um, and I know where he is right now. Yeah, and I'm thankful that uh, my children are the way they are yeah. right now. And well, it's you're not starting a new, and it's not thanks to me. You're starting you know? a new legacy with your kids. Correct. You know. Yes, and I try my best to let them know, uh, you know that. There is only one real way to live this yeah. life and everything else they don't really need to try it and to fall into that trap and to get bruised and all that because i i i've been there i know yeah i know what it is well you have wonderful kids i do and like jay and i have wonderful kids and so we have a saying that god gives wonderful kids to the worst parents <laughs> right and so we're so thankful that <laughs> well, I... god knows and so he's like okay i'll give you easy ones yeah <laughs> Well, I wouldn't say it's easy, but I would say that we have we have a lot of grace. Yeah, we find a lot of grace, and uh, nothing was easy. Yeah, uh, some were easier than others, but uh, overall, parenting is not a game. It's a full time job, and it's a lot of responsibility. Yeah. Um, In the words of that 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 mom that said to you, "Have you asked God?" Those just keep ringing yes. in my mind because it's like every every problem we face, whether it's raising our kids. You know, or looking for a job, or have you asked God? Correct. You know, and we're so thankful that we have a heavenly Father who watches over us and exactly. helps us and gives us discernment and wisdom as we parent our kids because yeah. we can't do it. And we have to be very in our own strength. We have to learn from how God is handling us. Uh, we have to learn how to do things. Not always we have to be soft. Yeah. Not always we have to let them. You know, get away. Yeah, with we're things. not their friends. Exactly. We're their parents. And also, we, we sometimes we chastise them I mean, in, in, in a metaphorical way. But I don't want to go beyond in that. In our family, we spanked our children. Yeah. We are not afraid to say well, it. We did that when they were very, very young. When they were very little, Two, if they needed it. But, but the point yes. is, is that um, nothing is easy. I mean, no. parenting is a tough job. Yeah. It's probably the most rewarding one yes, ever. Yes, 100%. And also, remember one thing. Um, again i go back to life mm -hmm. you know yeah god granted us life and we grant we, we continue that lifeline yeah. that he wants us to continue yeah. we have a responsibility to, to you know keep that going on yeah. and you know god said be fruitful and multiply mm -hmm. god is yep. not into reducing That's the population right. of planet nope. earth never was never will be nope and he's uh, pro marriage he is pro children yes. pro family pro life exactly it's the God that life serve. is the you know this is it you know it's all about life and and he, he told that to moses to tell the children of israel here i put before you evil yeah. and good life and death and mm -hmm. then he says choose life yep whenever people tell you that that pro-life it stands against pro-choice that's wrong mm -hmm. grammatically and it's wrong you know logically mm -hmm. you know pro the opposite of pro-life is pro-death by the way right but but pro-life is pro-choice mm -hmm. because he said, choose life, choose it, choose, choose life. life. And we have to choose life every day. Yeah. I had to choose life. Yep. I had to choose life and I, I choose now to give life and I choose and I want to believe that, you know, this ministry that we're in, in, you know, involved with is something that gives a lot of blessing to yeah. lives of people and Amen. want them, cause them to want to live for Absolutely. Christ. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Amir. Um, I'm excited just to, for people to see this podcast and to hear your story. And I think anytime there's thoughts of suicide, 
that come to anybody's mind, it's from the devil. It's not from the Lord. And so just like you said, give the Lord, give this world one more chance and ask God to show himself to you. And, and he will. And exactly. And, and you know, the, 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 the Satan wants to kill, steal, and destroy. Yeah. God wants to give us Came life and life and life abundance. and abundant yes. life. And that is what we are all about. That's what this podcast is all about yes. is speaking the abundant life that we have through a personal relationship with Amen. Jesus Christ. So let's just close in a word of prayer. Yes. I'd love to just pray over all those that are watching. Yes. Heavenly Father, we just thank you yes. for this time we've had, Lord, to hear mm. your story of goodness, grace, of pursuing a mirror. God, I thank you that you love your children so much. You love every child, Lord. There's no person that's an accident. Every person is designed by you, created by you for a purpose. And Father, we pray that if there's anyone watching this podcast or listening who is feeling hopeless, who's feeling discouraged, even suicidal, Father, that you would reach out to them, that they would reach out to you and that you would rescue them, God, and give them purpose, hope, and salvation, and a new life. We thank you, God, that you are so good. You are so faithful. And we just commit this to you, for your purposes, and for your glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, thank you so much for joining us for today's episode of the Tent Head Podcast. We look forward to seeing you next time.